Welcome to MICE Tech Talk with the Technical Information Scientists of the Jackson Laboratory. My name is Dr. Caitlin Gillen, and my job as a Technical Information Scientist is to serve the research community by answering all of your mouse-related questions. And I'm Dr. Peter. MICE Tech Talk is a way for us to connect with the research community and answer some of those mouse-related questions live. So hopefully you're ready with your questions because it's time for MICE Tech Talk. So today, let's talk Crelox. The Crelox system allows researchers to generate conditional and tissue-specific mutations or to express transgenes in a tissue-specific manner. Using the Crelox system, you can generate mouse models that are more precise and sophisticated than with standard knockout or transgene overexpression models. However, there are some definite unique challenges that, that are present when working with Crelox mice that you may have to deal with. So today we've prepared a couple of different discussion topics related um, to commonly asked questions that we get in TIS. And so for those of you that are watching live, definitely let us know um, in the comment section where you're tuning in from. Uh, let us know if you've ever worked with Crelox before and what your questions are. We'll try to answer some of those live today. So we get lots and lots of questions regarding Crelox by phone and by email. And I think one of the most common questions that we get is how do you breed Crelox mice? Yeah. And so when you're generating Crelox models, you're combining multiple mutations or transgenes. And that in itself is going to increase the complexity of breeding the mice. But a common misstep that a lot of researchers make is they set up their breeding with the phenotype of their mice as their goal. So as an example, you want to generate mice that have a liver-specific knockout of gene X. But when you're breeding mice, especially combining multiple mutations, what you want to do is focus on the genotype of the mice that you need. So for that same example, what you want to think about is generating mice that are homozygous for the gene, F, gene X flox allele and heterozygous for the liver-specific Cree. And by focusing your breeding on the genotype instead of the phenotype, you're gonna better be able to map out your breeding as well as also determine your expected Mendelian ratios so that you can make sure that you have sufficient numbers of mice that you need for the next round of breeding or for an experiment. Also in that, you wanna make sure that you include your control genotype or genotypes when you're planning all of your breeding so that you can produce all of the mice that you need for your experiments. Got it, so think genotype, not phenotype. Correct. So speaking about controls, um, another question that we get a lot is, what are the best controls for Crelox mice? Yeah, that, that is a common question. And unfortunately, there's really no single answer. It's gonna really depend on the specific Crelox model that you're generating and your specific research questions. And just to kind of give you an idea of how complicated a choice that can be, if we look at our previous example of the liver specific knockout of gene X, there are at least three different controls that we could use. We could use homozygotes for the gene X flox allele, but have no Cre. We could use mice that are homozygous for the gene X wild type allele, but are carrying the Cre transgene. Or we could have mice that are homozygous wild type for gene X and have no Cre. And there's not necessarily any reason that one is better than the other. It will really depend on your question. And then if your Cree also happens to be tamoxifen inducible, there's a whole nother set of possible controls you can have where you either administer tamoxifen or you don't. So really the best advice that we can provide is to review the literature from other researchers performing similar studies or using the same strains that you are to help guide you in your decision-making on what controls you need for your studies. Right. So another question that we get a lot is, how are you going to confirm that re or Cree recombination occurred? Yeah, that's a really common question. So, you know, as part of this, especially when you're trying to knock out a gene, you may well need to confirm the efficiency of that deletion or the Cree recombination. And ultimately, what most researchers end up doing is you look at either protein or mRNA expression to not to determine if you have knocked out that gene sufficiently. Um, if you're planning on using like a Western blot or quantitative real-time PCR, 
you really need to make sure that you can collect only those tissues in which the Cree is expressed. Because if you can't, you may end up having data that either it doesn't look like you actually knocked anything out or your data could be difficult to interpret. So if you have a situation like maybe you're trying to knock out a gene in specific neurons and you can't just collect the whole brain, you may need to look at doing something like immunohistochemistry or in situ hybridizations to confirm the recombination efficiency. Now, one thing that a lot of people run into is if you are looking at mRNA expression um, to confirm recombination, you really need to know where your probes or primers anneal to the RNA compared to the region that you actually delete with Cre. So just as an example, if you have LOXP sites flanking exon 4 of your gene, the promoter and the initial exons are all still intact, and it's absolutely possible that there can still be an expression product made from that promoter. It probably is not going to be functional, but it's present. And if your probes or primers are upstream of that deleted exon, you may actually appear like you're not getting any deletion at all if you're looking at RNA expression. So you want your probes or primers to be located either in the region you delete or um, at least one of them so that you make sure that you're, you're seeing what you're actually removing. I also highly recommend that what you do is review the references for both the Cree transgene and the LOXP flanked allele to see how other researchers confirmed recombination efficiency with that LOXP flanked allele and in the same tissues that you're trying to knock your gene out. That way, they may already have the appropriate reagents or at least show you where they are so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Right. So an, another question that uh, came in from one of our viewers um, was asking about Cree recombination efficiency, particularly in inducible models. Uh, do you want to comment on that? Well, I, I mean, what I just talked about, ultimately, even if your Cree is tamoxifen inducible or not, you're going to look at having to monitor um, protein or RNA levels. Um, you're just going to have to either do it with or without tamoxifen, probably both. Um, so you may need non-tamoxifen controls to see what it looks like before you add tamoxifen and after to look at the efficiency of the recombination once you add tamoxifen. Right. You're just adding a layer of complexity. And so efficiency is probably going to go down a little bit, right? Well, well, you're, you're also, well, you're adding another level of control and timing, True. right? So, so you want to make sure that also when you look at it, you give enough time after the tamoxifen to actually see that the recombination happened. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on and talk about tissue specific creeks. I know we had that planned a little bit to talk about. And then we're also getting some questions um, about Cree toxicity in certain tissues. Um, so let's let's talk about uh, Cree leakiness. Why should we care? Cree toxicity, those topics. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll start with the leakiness or off-target recombination, um, which is basically when the Cree is expressed in cells or tissues that you don't expect based on the promoter that's driving Cre. So you have a liver specific promoter, but there's some recombination in the heart or in the brain or something like that. Um, and if that leakiness is significant and you're unaware of it, it could help, it could, you could end up misinterpreting your data. And also if there's any leakiness in the germline, you could actually end up generating a complete knockout where you just have your gene knocked out in all tissues. Um, the first place I would always recommend you look is the references of people who have used that Cree strain, especially the original one, to see what tissues they actually looked for confirming Cree expression. Now, sometimes you're going to find that the authors only looked at the tissues where they were expecting Cree and not in other tissues. Um, so there's always a possibility that just nobody has looked. So if you are working with a new Cree strain and you don't have information and you're concerned, you can always cross your Cree strain to a Cree reporter strain, which is a strain that's designed to give you some sort of visible marker like GFP or luciferase or LAC-Z in any cells that express Cree. Um, that way you can confirm the tissue expression of Cree before you invest all your time and resources in doing all of the breeding that's necessary to get your mice. Um, in terms of the um, germline deletion, um, 
really recommend that you genotype your colony breeders for the Cree recombined allele. That way, if you do get any leakiness in the germline, you're going to be able to find it and you can remove those mice from your colony. In terms of Cree toxicity, um, there are references out there that seem to indicate that sometimes um, high levels of Cree expression can cause a phenotype just by the Cree expression. Um, I know we have one of our blog posts goes into that into more detail, um, but it could be due to cryptic lox P sites that are present in the genome. Um, and one way to potentially look into that issue is to use a control that's just Cree. So your Cree strain alone, you can look at the phenotypes that you're interested in to see if it's actually causing a phenotype um, due to just Cree expression. So that control of a Cree alone um, helps look at that sort of an issue. Right. And then what about uh, when Cree inserts into an area of the genome um, that's essential? So looking at hemizygous versus homozygous Cree mice. Yeah. Yeah. So when your Cree is generated by a transgene, lots of times you don't know where it integrated. And so um, you could see a different phenotype doing to be due to being homozygous for the Cree versus hemizygous. And that's probably why a lot of people stick with hemizygous Cree transgenic mice. Um, if you do decide that you want to look at making your Cree homozygous, you probably need to do um, that Cree alone as a homozygous as a control to make sure again that any phenotypes that you observe are due to knocking out your gene, not to being homozygous for the Cree transgene integrated somewhere in the genome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it looks like we got another uh, question from UNC Chapel Hill. Um, is it possible that leaky Cree may cause partial deletion, giving an apparent mosaic genotype? Certainly. Um, and, and it actually not even just leaky. I, I mean, if you have a Cree that's specific for certain tissues, it may not cut in 100% of the, let's take a step back. Let's go back to my liver specific Cree. You could have a liver specific Cree that doesn't express Cree necessarily or recombine your LOX P flanked allele in 100% of the liver cells. So you can definitely see sort of a mosaic type genotype you know, in your tissue of interest, that's why you're confirming recombination efficiency, right? By looking at RNA or protein to see how free, you know, how many, what percentage of the cells get cut. But anywhere that Cree is leaky, you know, it could be expressed in, say, some brain cells or some heart cells where you're looking mostly at the liver. So it may not be widespread in every single tissue that the leakiness happens in. Right, and we might even get mosaicism because the promoter is on in some cells and not other cells. So, also different LOX P flanked alleles will cut with different efficiency with the same Cree. So, somebody may use a Cree and have really great recombination efficiency with one flox allele, but your flox allele may not just not cut as well, and mm -hmm. so you could see a lower efficiency. Right. Let's see if we have any more questions that have come in. Uh, looks like we've got a hello from Atlanta, Georgia. Hello. Uh, Kentucky, Brazil, um, California, Seattle, Washington, India. So we're really happy to have all of you guys here. Uh, we'll hang out just for another minute in case somebody uh, wants to get a last minute question in. Um, I could, uh you know, if you do find that your recombination efficiency is not high enough, one way to deal with that is to look at using a complete knockout along with your flox allele. So you have one flox allele, one knockout allele in your Cree. That way the Cree only has to recombine one flox allele to create a knockout only in those tissues. Yeah. Let's see, we've got time for, I think, one more question. Um, how common is this that a particular Cree is lethal or not easy to be maintained in a particular sex? It probably depends on the Cree strain and how it was generated and where it's integrated. Um, I would say that a hemizygous Cree or a heterozygous Cree, for those being lethal, if that happens, it's going to be really hard or impossible to maintain. So that may be a situation where maybe homozygous Cree. Um, 
it certainly does happen. Um, but I, but I would say that probably is the minority. I would say that most Cree strains, even if they're randomly integrated, that you can make that maintain them as homozygous. But again, you may not want to because there could be phenotypes that you're not aware of due to that integration. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It looks like we're still getting a few more questions uh, about tamoxifen. Do you want to take a couple extra minutes to an- get those answered? Uh, right. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Um, so it looks like we've got some questions asking, you know, what tamoxifen is the best? There's so many protocols that can be used to activate Cree. Um, and then is there an inducible UBC Cree line that is reliable, reliably, oh, we got a not whole bunch leaky. of <laughs> Not leaky. Yes. Yes. Relating. So we'll kind of put all those tamoxifen ones well, together. I would say that the first place to start is with the references of people who have used the Cree strain before you um, as where you can source your tamoxifen to and for an initial protocol. But I can't emphasize enough how powerful a tool is getting a Cree reporter strain. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a, you cross your, Cree, your tamoxifen inducible Cree to the Cree reporter. Then you can test your Cree dosing regimen, um, your tamoxifen dosing regimen and your tamoxifen and, and see the cells visibly by GFP or RFP and get that whole protocol worked out while you're still breeding your mice. Um, the nice thing about the Cree reporter is it only involves one cross, single cross of your Cree to the Cree reporter, the double transgenic mice are all you need. So do those pilot studies ahead of time. That way, you know, the Cree is working and expressed where you want and your tamoxifen is getting to the tissues that you want. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can work out any leakiness issues. You can work out yep. dosing is- issues, uh, route of administration. There's so Absolutely. many things that you need to work out before you actually start your your Cree yep. tamoxifen experiments. Yep. And I can't tell you how many times we've had those conversations where people run into those problems and I end up telling them cross it to a Cree reporter and do this test. Um, but they've now got all their experimental mice and they're running into issues. It's always better to work out those problems before than Mm -hmm. when you're trying to get your experiment finished. Yeah. All right. Let's, let's wrap up these questions because we are out of time today, but it looks like we might need to have a second Crelox just for tamoxifen um, episode. So uh, watch out for that because based on your questions, it's probably coming soon. Um, Do you want to take just a second to talk about some of the resources that we have available on the Jack's website? Yeah, so um, in terms of those resources that we have there, if you're relatively new to Cree, um, that uh, webinar that we have recording um, on Cree Locks Basics is really great introduction. It also walks through some basic Cree Locks crosses um, that may be helpful to you to design your breeding. Um, the blog post on Crelox mice deleting what you think they are, that all goes into a much more in-depth discussion on leakiness, um, mosaicism, and those issues. Um, and the last blog post kind of covers some of the topics we've also talked to today, but also some other not as common issues that arise with the Crelox system. So all of those can be really helpful to help answer some of your issues that you are running into. Great, thanks. And if we didn't get to your question today, um, like I said, look out for a tamoxifen inducible Cree episode, as well as feel free to email your questions to micetech at jacks.org. Um, our next Mice Tech Talk episode is called Let's Talk the Basics of Designing Experiments Using Mice. And that'll be next Tuesday, August 25th. And we look forward to seeing you uh, on LinkedIn and YouTube. So this is Dr. Caitlin saying, stay healthy, stay safe, and stay excited about research. Thanks, everybody.